Are you a businesswoman who is finding it challenging to get your ideas across and make a point? Welcome to Speakers Who Get Results with Elizabeth Bachman, a podcast dedicated to helping women get the visibility they want, whether making a speech or talking in a meeting. Every week, get valuable lessons from Elizabeth or learn from her roundtable conversations with experts and speakers on how to make a difference, not just a point. On to the show with your host, Elizabeth Bachman. Hello and welcome to Speakers Who Get Results. I'm Elizabeth Bachman, your host, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the podcast where we talk about using presentation skills to move your listeners to take action. Whether you're speaking on a stage, you're in a meeting with a prospective client or a prospective customer, or in maybe in a meeting to inspire your team or get upper management to authorize what you want them to do, even a one-on-one conversation, it's all presentation skills designed to get a result. We also talk a lot about leadership, visibility, and how to be a leader in life for which presentation skills are a wonderful tool. My guest today is Michael Levitt of the Breakfast Leadership Network. He has a very, he's got a wonderful podcast. You've got to make sure to listen to him. And the official bio is he's the founder and chief burnout officer um, of the Breakfast Leadership Network, which is a San Diego and Toronto-based burnout media firm. Very smart of you to have Toronto for the summer and San Diego for the winter, I'm assuming. Unless yes. you're really Unless you're really a masochist and you do it the other way around. Uh, in the past, I have, and I, I've learned my lesson. Uh, yeah, yes, exactly. Michael is an in-person and certified virtual speaker, um, a certified NLP and CBT ther- therapist, a Fortune 500 consultant, number one best-selling author, hosts the Breakfast Leadership Show, which is one of the top 200 podcasts on iTunes. Bravo. Uh, he's also a top 20 global thought leader on culture with Thinkers 360 and a former healthcare executive overseeing $2 billion budgets. Wow, Michael, that's very impressive. Yeah. So two welcome billion, to Speakers two, Who Get Results. Right. Thank you so much. And, and $2 billion wasn't enough. The demand probably required more like $10 billion, but you, you do with what you do. I know billion sounds like a lot, and believe me, it is, but it never goes far enough, especially when it comes to needs of healthcare. But uh, ah. that, would, that would be a completely different conversation than today. <laughs> yes. Well, we'd love to have that conversation one of these days. It would be fun. Before we go into talking about burnout, which is, I'm, which is something that's coming up a lot right now, we're recording this in the middle of the pandemic shutdown, so, um, but I'd like to ask you, if, who would be your dream interview? If you could share the stage with someone who is no longer with us, who would it be, what would you ask them, and who should be listening? I would love to interview Winston Churchill and Ah. specifically why is for those that are familiar with his journey uh, to being prime minister and being a pivotal component. Prime minister of England. Of England. Correct. Yes. The United Kingdom. Uh, Yes. Uh, He was pivotal and a crucial component in the end of World War II. And if you look at his journey and how he obtained that role, it was more or less by a default situation. He was not chosen necessarily to be that role. He kind of ended up in the role because of uh, challenges and all of that stuff. So his journey along the way in, in life and everything else, it was, it was almost a miracle that he ended up being in that role, plus you know, you know the work that he did and, and the strategy that they used to basically save thousands, if not millions of lives, uh, is inspiring. And the reason why I want to interview him is going through those challenges where he wasn't chosen. He wasn't Mm. the one that they wanted. I wanted to know how he persevered through that. Why did he continue? Why did he stick around? Because, you know, much like 
any type of relationship, if the other party doesn't want you around, typically that's a cue for you to, you know, find somebody else or, or leave or, or go somewhere. And, and he didn't. And I'd be curious as to why. And, there, and the people that would need to listen to that would be business leaders and entrepreneurs and, and those that are struggling with life and trying to figure out what do I need to do in life and, and listen to Churchill's story of how he was able to persevere and end up being you know, one of the most revered you know, world leaders in the 20th century. Well, um, you know, he was, <clears throat> he was on the side that ultimately won, which helps. And, yes. and, and it was because of what he did. Who should be listening? I, I think entrepreneurs, uh, especially those that are just early days of their business and they're trying to get clients and no one's answering the call and they're just not cracking the nut to figure out, okay, how am I going to grow this business? I think his story can be used in such a way to just persevere and, and navigate through the challenges of being a business owner and also just in life in general. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and take those lessons and apply them you know, to where they would fit in your own personal journey. Ah, wonderful. So, Michael, you're, you're an expert about burnout, which is why I really wanted to bring you in here because I work with high-level women, um, mostly often in the tech field, uh, who are now all working from home and finding themselves with home duties and work duties and uh, uh, and trying to say yes to everybody and uh, it, it is working harder than ever so it, it, talk about how you define burnout burnout is when you have a prolonged period of time of stress that you have not addressed and it builds up over time to the point where you are just physically and mentally and in often cases spiritually just burned out. Uh, life becomes numb. Every, everywhere you turn feels like you're getting beaten up and it, it drains your energy. It drains your well being. You lose motivation. You're not eating well. You're not sleeping well. Every aspect of your life is impacted by burnout and it has such a huge ripple effect because it impacts everyone around you. Mm hmm. I keep thinking about boundaries, burnout and boundaries, because how can, I mean, if you've got a level of stress and you say, okay, I need to take care of myself, but I also need to get so much more done, mm -hmm. how can we address it? I guess there are two pieces to this, so this might be the same question. How can how can we address burnout if we feel like if we're feeling burned out? Um, I've been there. How can we address it before it becomes a crisis, before we wind up in the hospital with a heart attack or something? And how can we also set the boundaries that are necessary in order to address burnout before it becomes a crisis in terms of convincing managers and bosses and people like that, that you, I'm sorry, I just have to stop working now. Does that make yeah, sense? Oh, no, definitely. It definitely does. You know, the, the first part is you have to prioritize your self-care and that's something that a lot of people really have a difficult time doing for a few reasons. One, uh, they think it's selfish and they think, mm -hmm. well, if I'm taking care of me, that means I'm not taking care of anybody else, which is a false belief because if you truly take care of yourself, then you are the best version of you. So when you do help or serve others, they're getting a much better version of you. And they're, you're giving it with full energy and clarity, and you'll be able to navigate through a lot of these things. Right now with the working from home situation, the working from home burnout is skyrocketing. We're seeing you know, on average, Americans are working three more hours a day than before the pandemic started. And my first thought on that is, okay, somebody finally found that 27 hour clock. Awesome. But how do we get back that time? But no, what they did is they traded their commute time to work. So instead yeah. of getting up, getting dressed, cleaned up, eating and dropping kids off to school and going to work, they just wake up and they go to work and they continue it into the night and on the weekends and that's not sustainable. And 
I think one of the biggest challenges too is so many of us think that we can do everything. We can do it all and we can't. It's just not possible for our own long-term well-being. So you have to establish boundaries around how you work, when you work, and when you don't. This is interesting times because many of us, you know, not only are we working from home now, our loved ones are working with us and many of us are now full-time school teachers. So you you throw that all in and we have our own full-time job. So you're not going to be able to do it all. It's just not possible. So what you have to do is you have to work with everybody involved and, and figure out how can we get what we truly need to get done in a way that doesn't take a toll on us long term. So it's having communications with your boss and your employer saying, okay, here's the working hours that, that um, I can get my role done. And you know, work with them and sort it out because employers should recognize that many of their employees are in this situation. And as managers and leaders, in all likelihood, they are too. So we're all in this uh, weird situation where we have all these additional demands that are thrown on us. So we have to figure out ways to make sure that the kids are getting the education that they need. May need to scale it back. And I know educators may not like me hearing me say this, but I think we need to scale back a little bit on the lessons to get them the basics right now because hopefully this is a very short-term situation and the kids will eventually be able to go back to school. I'm not going to get into any type of political debate as when they should go back. That's, I leave that to scientists and safety and figuring all of that out when they should go back when it's safe. But until that point comes, and even when they do, look at the curriculum and go, okay, let's scale things back. Let's do the basics and then we'll catch up or get the things that they need because we don't have pandemics all the time. Same thing with work. Organizations should ask their clients, what do you need from us right now? Because we're going to focus on that. You know, we scale things back a little bit so we're not all working these crazy hours that are, again, very difficult to do when we've got all these other responsibilities that are thrown at us. And, and, and it all boils down to just having communication with everybody and, and getting an understanding of what the employer needs, what the employees need, harmonizing the two so it it isn't such a toll because the last thing you want to do as an employee or as an employer is get sick. You, you don't want that because if your immune system gets lowered, there's a distinct possibility that you could contract this virus. And depending on your own situation with your health, it could be deadly. Um, we know the stats. We can argue, okay, a certain percentage is fine, but that's not a risk that I'm willing to take. And I don't want anybody else to take that risk either. Now, on boundaries, real quick. Yeah, it's just that there's more to this, yes. Yes. Yeah. The, the boundaries is you have to establish boundaries around your life, begin for your own self-care. So you need to set boundaries when you work and when you don't. Have a firm start to your workday and a firm end to it. With technology and smartphones and laptops, we can work pretty much anywhere. And I know a lot of people do. Mm -hmm. I see pictures all the time on social media. Here I am working and I'm on the beach. Here I am by the pool working. And I'm one to say that's great that you can work in a really pleasant environment. However, you're taking away from the moment of that pleasant environment. When you're at the pool, you should go swimming. You should sit by the pool, get tan, do whatever you're doing. Don't jump in the pool with your laptop. That's not a good idea. Yeah. But But don't don't marry those two because what happens and we're seeing it now with this working from home situation is we've merged two worlds that really shouldn't merge as far as stress levels and boundaries. We've kind of merged them all together. So there's no escape. We've all had bad days at work where we're really happy when we get to go and leave. We get in our car and we drive home. So we, at the end of the day, if you have a bad day in your home, and we're in a quarantine situation, nowhere to go but home. You're already there. So I, I always advise people, if you're working from home or working remotely, designate a place, have a boundary of where you work, whether it's a table. Ideally, you have something ergonomic so you don't have to see a, a massage therapist after mm -hmm. you know, working home for six months. And I know a lot of people are going to need that because they're not working in an ergonomic state. So establish a boundary where you work establish a boundary when you work um, and communicate with your family 
your, you know, if you're, you know, both parents are home, negotiate when you're going to educate your kids, how that looks, work with the school, figure out what needs to be done. And it's, it's not the ideal time. We know this, but there's ways to do it. So you don't take a toll on yourself because the last thing you want to do is run yourself down to the point where you're sick and then you go into the hospital. Even if you don't have COVID-19, you're still taking up a resource at the hospital where those hospital resources need to be prepared to deal with people that are dealing with this illness and not somebody that just ran themselves to the ground. Yeah, well, that's, that's true. I had a conversation the other day with a client who is, was complaining about working all the time. And I said, well, have you tried to build in breaks and build in times for you to go for a walk? And she said, yeah, yeah, but then, and my admin puts them on my schedule and then somebody says they need me and I book something. <laughs> And, and I said, you know, what? you could actually ask your admin to, uh, to check that and to get back to you to say, did you really want to do this? Mm-hmm. Because that was her in terms of setting boundaries. And then, then the administrative assistant can, can feel important for taking care of her boss and, and the boss who tends to say yes, you know, and then complains. Uh, she was, uh, she, you know, it's, it's like, it's like the, uh, the double opt-in, you know, do you really want to send this email mm-hmm. kind of thing. But how can you, do you have any tips for people who are then shamed for taking time off? Yeah, it's... <laughs> And some people will do that, you know, the, the hustle mentality that you see in a lot of entrepreneur talk, uh, even those people take time away. Uh, mm-hmm. You have to take time away to be your best self. You need to take breaks during your day uh, because those breaks, one, help you re-energize. It also gives you opportunity for clarity. You know, we've all heard, mm-hmm. you know, we get, we get the greatest ideas in the shower. Right. Well, and the reason being is not just because the steam and, and the water, unless you're a cold shower person, uh, but the reason why we get those is because we're in a moment where we're, we don't have all of these inputs going on. It's actually, you know, relatively just you, the shower, you're getting cleaned up mm-hmm. and you, you have some clarity on some things. That's what thoughts come in. Cause those thoughts want to come in a lot. And the key is to get yourself in a place where, you can have those thoughts mm-hmm. coming in, creative thoughts, not the worry about, okay, I've got that tough call this afternoon or this, and more of how can I grow the business? How can we serve our clients better? What can we do to improve the morale at work? What can we do about all of these things? When you take breaks, it gives yourself the opportunity to, I don't call it daydreaming, but that's what it is. It's just think about, okay, what can we do? And leaders oftentimes are horrible about taking time off. They work these 12 to 16 hour days and they're not seeing any vision about where they can take the organization. They're trying to work through it instead of taking a step back, doing what they should do and direct and lead and look for opportunities for vision opportunities. And right now, especially during a pandemic, there has never been a better time to have innovation as top of mind of what do we do differently Mm -hmm. now that we've had this opportunity to be able to steer this organization in the direction that it needs to go to serve our clients and and take care of our employees. One of the things that uh, I'm also hearing is because so many of it, we're working from home now, um, those of us in the, in the knowledge business, if you will, or knowledge workers, because we don't have day-to-day visual contact with our team, then there's a lot of time, extra time spent in, um, in taking care of the team and keeping the connections going in the, the team, you know, all this network building. I think of it as weaving the spider web or strengthening the net, which takes time away from when you should and, and yet you're still expected to churn out as much work as you did when you weren't spending hours each day talking to your team. 
Do you have any suggestions for managing that? Yeah, that's a huge problem because you see a lot of organizations that are zooming the heck out of their employees and they're having all these check-ins all the time. And for many of those employees, it's, it's derailing them from the deep work that they should be doing. As a manager or leader, you should have a series of guidelines and tasks that you want your teams to work on. Mm-hmm. Give them the best instructions on how to do it, then get out of their way and let them do it. Be available to them if they have questions, have check-ins scheduled and all that. You can have a weekly check-in call where it's optional. I see some organizations do this. It's not mandatory attendance. It's optional. If you've got something to bring up to the team or a question, you can do it. Uh, otherwise, you know, set times of when people can check in with you. Uh, then that way you're letting people do the deep work because one of the biggest problems we had prior to the pandemic was how many times people get interrupted during the workday, especially oh, in the yeah. environment. Yeah, the number of interruptions that people get are in the dozens a day. And it takes our brains several minutes to get back to task from the interruptions. And these are phone calls, people stopping by your desk, emails, text messages, uh, pages over the system, all of these things. That's why you see so many people wearing headphones like this oftentimes when they're working. So they can do their best to try to focus and, and actually get something done. And if people were allowed to do the deep work and work on their things without interruptions, they would accomplish those things much faster. Now that does not give organizations a permission to, oh, wow, you did that in three hours. You've got another you know, two hours that I can fill it up with real quick. Again, mm-hmm. going back to let your employees have some time to be creative and have clarity and think about what they could do more efficiently when they finish things because that's when you start finding efficiencies and finding new ways to do things or maybe even new products or services that come up. We've, we've all heard the stories about, about how things were invented oftentimes by accident. Mm-hmm. And those accidents were because people had the time to go, huh, I wonder if we could use it this way. And all of yeah. a sudden, that is a product or service that we all use on a daily basis that would not have been created if that employee or that team didn't have the opportunity to play and, mm-hmm. and kind of figure things out. So just because you have somebody quote unquote sequestered for an eight hour shift doesn't mean you need to load up every single minute of it with do this, do this, do this, let them figure out a way to do things more efficiently. And one of the common things that I say, and I love people laugh at me about this is if you've got a new project or a task that needs to be done that hasn't been done before, if you can assign it to the laziest person in your organization, do it because they will get it done in the least amount of steps as possible. Mm -hmm. It's a roundabout lean, it's a roundabout lean methodology. Although I don't Mm -hmm. remember Deming calling it lazy people, but, Mm -hmm. um, but it's one of those things, not all the time, but it's a way for like, okay, I wonder how long it would take to do this because as leaders, sometimes we overcomplicate things like, well, I got to do this and get the Gantt chart this and then, and you just have this 40 step thing that could have been done in three. So it, 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 it's one of those things where allow your creative people that you've hired to be creative and, and get the job done uh, in ways that you would would probably be surprised that they finished, but they did. And then you can take those opportunities to come up with new things. Yeah. You know, the the thought about new ideas and so forth. I always remember Isaac Asimov, I believe, said, great scientific discoveries don't come from a Eureka. I found it. They come from, huh, that's Mm -hmm. funny. Mm -hmm. And there goes, and then, we're wondering about that is what leads you to uh, to the great discoveries. Absolutely. So, Michael, um, just a little bit more about boundaries and burnout. It's hard to prove a negative. So how can we tell the people who don't get it, who don't get how important this is, mm-hmm. how can we show the value of keeping things running well because it's human nature to only deal with something when it's a problem. It's sort of the natural human thing. If we want to say, I'm going to stop at three o'clock 
because I'm going to go take, that's when I pick up my kids or you know, it's my turn to take care of the kids and everything is going to run fine. How can we prove that taking the self-care is making things run fine? I think one of the things that, and especially with somebody that's burning out and they're trying to get past that, likely they're making mistakes. So, and that's a sign of burnout is if you're making mistakes, you're irritable, a variety of other things. If you're able to demonstrate to your employer, okay, look, I'm going to work on these tasks during these times and you deliver. And if you can deliver early, don't beat yourself up over it. But if you do have that uninterrupted time and you focus on the task at hand, in many cases, you will complete it sooner than you would have if you were doing it the way that you used to do when you went into the office and had all the interruptions. So the key is you, it, it's proving to the employer that, yes, you can do it. A lot of it is buy-in. A lot of it is negotiations. You say, look, I want to try this. And, and you give mm. them the permission as an employer to say, you know what, it's not working. We need you to go back to doing it this way. So for them, it's a, it's a win-win scenario. They win if you get it done more efficiently because, well, you just found efficiency. But they also win if you say, well, you know, we tried that. It didn't work. So I'll go back to doing things this way. They're still getting the outcome that they wanted, which was the completed task or project or, or whatever the case may be. So you, you, you paint it in a way where it's a win-win for them. So it makes it very difficult for them to say no. Because especially if you map it out. And I'll remember the time of you know, one of my children, wanted to uh, basically go into homeschooling. She was going to school and she had some, and I have no problem sharing this because she gives me permission to, um, because she's an adult now, but she had some anxiety issues when she was Mm -hmm. younger. So she wanted to be homeschooled. And I said, well, you know, come up with a plan and, and map it out with the pros and the cons and she was young but you know she she so she went to the store she bought this poster board she bought some stickers and she had this huge flow of things i mean i'm like when did you start taking project management courses (laughs) are are you are you actually a phd is this something what are you doing I, i remember seeing this poster and she started the presentation i mean she was literally a minute into it and i've already made my mind up it's like yeah you can we can try this but mm-hmm. she went through the effort to justify this is how it does. And if it doesn't work, then I promise I will go back to this. And, you know, she thrived at it. It was the right thing for her at that time. She's obviously you know, grown up and is doing great things now. It, but it was, it was one of those challenges that, you know, they presented it to me kind of in a, a boss type of situation, or in this case, dad situation, um, that, I, you know, that she wanted to do this and it made sense. And I knew that she would do the work and she did. And I had no concerns about that because as an employer, you should know your employees. Uh, even mm-hmm. if it's a large scale organization, you've got managements and, and levels. Someone should know your employees and what makes them really shine. What are some, where their strengths are and do everything you can as an employer to make sure that they operate in those strength areas as much as possible. Cause they'll be happier. They'll have lower stress they'll be a productive employee and they'll do great things for your company. Wow. And that sounds like a great line to end on. Uh, Michael, Michael Levitt, how can we find out more about you? Yep. The best place to find me is go to breakfastleadership.com. There's all kinds of things on there. I've got my podcast show and everything else, but everything is on there. Um, there's, you know, tools and techniques and uh, my blog. I have a, a ton of business articles on that. And on the show I interview, uh, global thought leaders like yourself uh, mm-hmm. and, and others that uh, are, are doing great things to educate the listeners on, you know, the many different ways that they can approach, you know, their own success and inspire people to be able to do the things. And, and everybody can beat burnout. Everybody can get past it. And, and more importantly, they can learn the signs so they can prevent it from happening again. So breakfastleadership.com yeah. is the best place to find me. Why breakfast? Two reasons. Number one, uh, there's two parts to the name. The leadership part is one, you know, I'm a leadership junkie. I love leaders. I read mm-hmm. leaders. I studied, I've studied them forever and, and, and stolen from, you know, the great ideas of things and ignored some others. And breakfast, there's two components to that. Number one, I find in working, especially with C-suite and most leaders, 
if you get them first thing in the morning, you have their attention. Once they get into work and they're in the trenches, good luck getting them out of there. They're deep into work mode and they're not easy to really get the attention because they're focusing on all the things that are going on in life. And breakfast is my favorite meal. So I thought if I'm going to own a company, I should probably name a name that I like. So <laughs> that's, that, that's where I came up with the name. I'm with you there. So I have my morning ritual and, you know, woe, woe betide anybody who interrupts me because this is my time for me before I have to do anything else. Exactly. You're setting yourself up to be the best version of you throughout your day. Exactly. Michael Levitt, thank you so much. It's truly an honor to have you on my podcast. And I, um, I had a blast being on your podcast. So it will be fun when we're both, we're both out there. This has been Speakers Who Get Results. Before we go, I want to remind you that if you're curious about how your presentation skills are going, you can take our four-minute assessment. It's free at speakforresultsquiz.com. That's www.speakforresultsquiz.com. And that's where you can see where you are strong in your presentation skills, where maybe you might need a little bit of support. Michael Levitt, thank you so much for having been on Speakers Who Get Results. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Thank you all for listening. If you had a good time, share us, tell your friends, like us on, on YouTube, subscribe on YouTube, like us on iTunes, all of that. This has been Elizabeth Bachman. I'll see you on the next one. We have just concluded another great episode of Speakers Who Get Results with your host, Elizabeth Bachman. If you got value from today's episode, please feel free to share us with your friends and colleagues. You may also visit elizabethbachman.com for additional resources. Be sure to tune in every week for new episodes. And thanks for tuning in.